You're listening to the Atlanta Dream Center Church Podcast. If you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com, where every dollar advances the kingdom of God. We hope that this message edifies and encourages you to do the great things God has called you to do. So we're going to be talking about something, and it's that God is not far. No, that's not what it is. God is near. Tell me that title again, girl. I put it up there for you. I sent it to Evelyn. I believe God is not far. Everyone say, not far. There we go. Let's get you alive today. Look, I only got you guys for like 30 minutes, so I need you alive, all right? How many of you guys know that your neighbor sometimes falls asleep in service? How many of you guys know that? You guys have seen that, yeah? You sit in the same place, Anna. You got one neighbor there. That's your husband, all right? Hey, listen, today I want you to keep him awake because today's sermon is important. I want to change your perspective a little bit about where God is. Because I don't know how many of you guys have ever felt this, but have you guys ever asked God, where are you? Have you guys ever asked that before? God, where are you right now? Man, am I, am I tripping? Let me ask that again. How many of you guys have ever asked God, where are you? Has anyone ever asked? Yeah, there we go. That's more real. Man, me too. I, I've done this thing in church, and I've done this a million times, y'all, where I'll come to church, and we'll play some worship songs, and, and people will be, you guys have been here when it's church service like that. People will be like just standing there or sitting, and no one's even singing the songs. You guys know what I'm talking about? And you leave church and go like, man, I don't think God was there today. <laughs> And you leave and go, man, where's God? Or maybe, maybe you've been in a really tragic situation. And you've asked the question, God, where are you? Like, where are you? I, 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 I feel very alone. And last week, we, we talked about something really major, man. I was talking about, man, we need to give up our pleasures to see how good the Lord is. And, and I was trying to tell you, man, we cannot get comfy with the world. But a lot of the times we get comfy with the world is because it's the closest thing to us. It's easy to see a quick solution in the world. And sometimes when we're coming to the Lord, man, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I seem to miss him. Or if I don't miss him, I'm trying to figure out where are you, God? Where are you in these circumstances? Where are you in my personal life? And it's not even the crazy times. Can I just be real with you? Sometimes I open my Bible, I'm going, God, this is so boring. Have you guys ever had that before? Can I confess something to you guys? Just this morning, I'm reading the Bible. Don't judge me, okay? Because I'm reading the Bible in the shower. That's what I was doing. I was in the shower, not even cleaning myself. And we're reading Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastes, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm reading it, and, and, and by the end of the third chapter, I seriously thought, what did I just read? Have you guys ever done that? We're reading the actual, like the Word of God, right? We're reading the Bible, the most, not just the most uh, 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 crazy historical texts, but the most holy texts in the world. And I'm standing in the shower, and, and I'll be honest with you, if we were to give this Bible to a nation who's never had it, they would probably devour that thing, right? And here I am in the shower just staring at my phone. And I, I, I realized something. We get so consumed with trying to find God. And what we usually do is we kind of put it on him. Where are you? Where are you, God? David does it through the psalm over and over. Oh, God, don't turn your face from me. Where are you, God? Some of us will watch the news or we'll just get on social media and we go, man, God is missing in our nation. God is missing in the nations. That's what we say. As if God wasn't omnipresent and he's not present in these circumstances. And so today, I, I want to hit on this one simple topic. I'm not going to take a lot of time on it because I don't need to, but it's called God is not far. Everyone say, not far. Come on, I love an active church. And I want to say this before I actually get into the word. I've been convicted about how we do church. I'm not changing it. Don't worry. You'll still have your seats. We'll still have a speaker. But I've been convicted because we've, we've done something. We've made this about a, a pastor and a worship team in a, in a Sunday school. But the church was never meant to be reduced to those three things. 
And so when I say active church, I'll be honest with you. Can I tell you why I love it when you're talking and you're, you're participating? Because church was never supposed to be about observing. It was supposed to be about partaking in the fellowship of Jesus together. And so I, I, I'm saying that to you because we're launching the groups kind of out of that notion. No, 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 we should be getting together. And I'm also saying that to you as a church. I always want interaction from you because I want to fight against the idea that you are a consumer Christian here to receive and receive and receive. But rather, we are together on this coming in unity. Amen. And I don't know about you, but when I say, let's get excited and let's shout. And I'm up on the stage going, you know, when David saw the presence of God, he danced. I'm talking to you to encourage you. This isn't a time to just sit here and receive. This is actually a time as a church that we come in unity and prayer and celebration. Amen? Amen. Okay, that's a side note. God's not far. Let me pull up my notes. I was uh, 19 years old. I was dating this girl, my only other girlfriend before my wife. Now I love my wife. But I didn't know her then, so I didn't love her yet. And I was just heartbroken over this girl. We were in a relationship, and, and how many of you guys remember the woes of your teenage years when it came to love? You want to remember that? It was just so, it, it, it was the worst. Like, seriously, it was the worst. You don't know what's happening. You have these emotions, and I remember I was, I was praying and fasting because I'm a super good Christian, and uh, <laughs> no, I was. I was praying and fasting, and I was going before the Lord, and I kept asking the same question. God, I feel so alone, and I should have had an illustration today, but I didn't take the time. But I, I had this vision. I was in my room. This, the girl I was dating at the time, she went to this job. And I was by myself. It was 6 o'clock in the morning. And before she, I'm sorry, it was 5 o'clock in the morning. And before she left to work, I woke up at 5 o'clock to say goodbye to her. Isn't that crazy love right there? Isn't that nuts? Me and Susie have been married for 13 years. If I'm waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning, there's no way she's waking up to say goodbye to me. That, that phase was over 12 years ago when we got married. That's not true. Susie would do that for me. And I had this vision. I was in the room, and, and, and this girl left. I had all this angst in me. And I got down on my knees. I was praying. In this, we were in this 10 apartment complex, all me and these other Christians. And there was this one room that was empty. So I went in there to pray. And I was sitting there. I was praying, going, God, where are you? And I remember just this angst. You guys know what I mean by angst, right? This just heavy emotional feeling on me. You guys have been there, I'm sure. I'm praying, going, God, I just feel like I've been fasting and praying, and I just can't see you. And I have this image of me on my knees, and I'm there, and I'm alone. There's fog all around me. This is the vision I had, right? There's fog all around me. And I'm sitting there, and I can see myself wilting away. I'm starving. And I knew spiritually what it was talking about in this vision. I knew I'm spiritually starving, and I'm crying out to the Lord, oh, God, where are you? And the Lord had just spoke to me real gently and said, I have been here from the beginning. And in this little vision I have, and listen, I'm not going to preach off the vision, but I just want to take this because I want to use this and go into the word. And this vision I had, the fog dispersed as soon as he said that, and I was surrounded by a banquet of all this food. It was right next to me the whole time, but because I couldn't see the food and I had this fog around me, I was dying of starvation. And I, I've had that vision in my heart for a long time, and, and I, I, I kind of feel like that's happened within the church. Here we are, believers, we go, I know the Lord is the bread of life. I will eat of him. And we take those scriptures, and we go, man, I'm going to consume him. He says, if you don't eat of my flesh, I'm going to eat God, you know, and we get wild. But then we look around, and there's these people, just this group of Christians, and we look like we're starved. Like the spiritual encounters with God seem so far and few in between. And we, we kind of like walk this walk and it's like, yeah, God's awesome, but I got to get fed elsewhere. And that was kind of what, what last week was about. We are looking to the world to be fed. And the Lord's going, don't you know that I am right here with you? I am not far. So we're going to talk about a few stories we're going to actually talk about a scripture, and we're going to just nail out one thing to you. God is not far. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. If you have your phones, I want you to change to Acts 17. I forget. I'm on my phone doing it. We're going to go to verse 22. 
I'm going to read the scripture. I'm going to point something out, and then we're going to continue, all right? You guys down for that? Now, this scripture is Paul. He's in Greece. He's walking around, and he's looking at all these Greek mythology and all these gods, and he sees a statue. It says, the unknown God. And he's going to take this opportunity to use it to preach the gospel. It says this, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. How many guys know that being religious is a good thing? I want to say that again. Being religious is a good thing. You know what religious means? Disciplined unto a belief. That's what it means. Now, I want to say that because in the church, we made that a, a bad word. Don't be religious. But he's actually complimenting them. I see that you're disciplined in your beliefs in all things. The next verse, 23, says this. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it. The God who made the world. I want you to hang on to those scriptures for a second. The one who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord, that means master of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything from us. Since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men. Can I stop here for a second? I want to kind of reflect on Juneteenth for a second. I want to tell you why slavery was wrong. I want to tell you why it's important to understand that racism is insanity and deceptive from the world. It says this right here. God has made from one blood every nation. Let me tell you about heritage for a second. If you're claiming your heritage just 300, 600, 800 years ago, you haven't gone far enough backwards. You and I share the same heritage. And any man who judges another man by their culture or their nation or their skin color doesn't know their God. I want to say that to both ends of the spectrum. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are my brother and my sister before anything else. I don't care about what culture you had or have. Once you bring on Jesus in your life, you walk in a different kingdom and culture. And that is where our unity comes in. Amen? Anyways, let me get back. And he was made from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far. Everyone say, not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought to to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. This scripture I love because Paul points out something so amazing to these men and women who are serving idols. He said, there is a God who is not far from you. And he's seeking out that men, and it says this, would grope for him. Do you know what that means? Paul's using language of blind people. He's saying he is near, and if you would just start putting your hands out there, where are you, God? And it says reaching out and groping as one who cannot see where he's at, but looking for him and saying, where is he going? Where is he at right now? The reason why I love that terminology and that language is because I believe that that is the greater picture for you and I. That God is not looking for a place to dwell here. He's looking for people to reach out for him who is nearby. 
Can I say that again? Your Christian walk isn't about getting God to intervene in your circumstances. Your Christian walk is about reaching out to where he's at. I got I to gotta change your perspective for a second. Too many of us are asking God, will you show up in my circumstances? And God's saying, why don't you just open your eyes? I am here. <laughs> Father's Day. It's Father's Day. And honestly, if you guys know anything about me, Gideon has stolen my heart. I love all my kids. But this guy, look at him, look at you smiling. Come on. <laughs> I can't hold you the whole time. I, my arm's not that strong. No. Yeah, no? Okay. <laughs> Y'all, this is how church should look, by the way. You know, we don't have to, be, I don't have to be in a suit and, you know, no kids around. How many of you guys know Jesus gives his Holy Spirit, and there's no junior Holy Spirit, and he can move in children. Don't you guys know that? When we look at John the Baptist, what happened in the womb? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him while he was still in the womb. Somebody, come on. Isn't that a good testimony of who God is? All right, but I'm going to put you back down just because I'm going to be sweating too much. Yeah. Yeah, plus I want all the attention, and you're going to steal that from me. <laughs> This is what he says. When we backtrack and go back, I got so con- confused when he came up here. Look at that scripture. It says this, that he appointed times and boundaries of their dwelling, talking about all men. And this is insane, what I'm about to read to you again. I'm going to read this again to you. He pre-appointed times and boundaries amongst all men. Boundaries are Nations. Times are the seasons and the times. And this is why. Check this out. That they should seek the Lord. That means look for him. Not beg him to show up, but said look for him. And hopes that they might grope for him. That means reach for him. And find him, though he is not far from each one of us. There's another scripture we're going to read here in a few, and some other scriptures. If you just look about how where God is at currently, where he's at right now, this kind of shakes me up when I talk about. I hate talking about this, and but it's it's true. You and I are not living in a nation absent of God. You are not living in a family absent of God. You're living in a nation and a family who might be not recognizing God, who might be profaning God, but God is not absent. And this is why I want to say this to you. Stop asking God to show up and start asking God to open up our eyes. Stop saying, God, save the nation and start saying, God, humble the nation that they might see you. Humble my family that they might see you. We keep saying to God, we do this. If God would just do a miracle, maybe then they would change. If God would just do something great, then maybe people, people can't see his greatness. They are groping in the world. Can we just do something really quick? Can I just show you an example of what this really looks like? Uh, Chris, I didn't tell you to do this. Will you turn off the lights? It's not going to be pitch black in here, so no kissing each other or nothing like that, okay? We'll still see you. I want all the lights off, all the lights off. The screen will still be on. But I just want to give you an image for a second. One time, uh, this is as dark as it gets. This is pretty bright still. Oh, that's better, wow. This is pretty dark. This would be sight that's dim. This is a dim sight right here that we look around. And this is what I love about this is that you could still see boundaries in this place. I can still see this white frame on the wall. About, I don't know, five weeks ago, six weeks ago, me and my wife were on a walk, and I decided I'm going to close my eyes and see what it's like to be blind. Have you guys ever done that before? And I decided for the next, like, 45 minutes, I wasn't going to open my eyes. And I walked around. You know what happened? It felt like the space I was in was forever. The darkness never ended. I felt like if I took off running, I know eventually I would run into a wall somewhere or a tree somewhere. But when I had my eyes closed, there was 
nothing around me. And I didn't know what was to my right or to my left. And this is what happened. I was frozen. I was completely frozen when I had my eyes closed. I needed my wife. And so, you know, she didn't know what I was doing. You know, we we're just walking casually. And all of a sudden, I'm just like grabbing her arm. I put my hand on her shoulder. And I say, Susie, I'm blind. <laughs> And until I had something to hang on to, I couldn't move because I was afraid. And this is what I've noticed in the church. We're believers, and we know that there's a great God. And I talked about earlier, but I, I have this feeling that there's a starvation that's happening. But more than just a starvation, I feel like there's been a freezing. The church doesn't know where to move. And they're going, oh, I proclaim Jesus, I know him, but they're stuck in kind of this darkness, this blindness. And they're going, man, I can't seem to find God in my life. And so our prayers consist of, oh, God, will you do this? And, oh, God, will you show up here? And, God, will you do something great? And it's like this, where we're in this dim, lit idea of life, and God's going, I am right here. What do you even want to ask for? You can turn on the lights before people start falling asleep. The language that he's using is, you are blind, but if you seek him, that means look for him. You can turn on the lights, Chris. Did you fall asleep back there? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. The language he's using is this, the world. He says, if they would just look for him, they would find him because he is near to every single one of you. Now, let me just break this down for a second. God is not man. Now, I have to reemphasize this over and over for you because I know I have to reemphasize this for myself. God is not man. So when I tell you that God is near you, this is where I got shaken up. I avoided it a second ago, but I'm back. When I tell you that God is near you, I'm not talking about this dude, you know, who's in heaven. The scripture says this, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the master of them both. I want to just talk about his position for a second. He is the one who set the times and the boundaries in the world. We're talking about the one who's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, who was there before the creation and will be there after the destruction. We're talking about the one who says this in scriptures. He knows every single thought of yours. If you're reading the Bible plan with us, if you're not, I encourage you to jump on it. But if you're reading the Bible plan with us, it says that he knows every single thing that you've done. Every intention of your heart. Not one thing is hidden from him. It gets a little scary. He says he'll expose them all. Whew. That's going to be a humbling day for us all. He says that that's the one. Revelations chapter 1 says it describes him this way. It says that he is man, right? Jesus in the glorified body. It says that his face is shining like the sun. His hair is like wool. He has a sash of gold, right? And it says that his feet are like bronze in the fire. And he's sitting on a throne that thunders and lightnings are speaking. This is the creepiest thing you'll ever read. They're speaking out the praises. And there's this beautiful thing around them. I don't know how to describe it. John describes it like a crystal lake, right? And there's rainbows and crazy sounds coming. And there's these creatures all around them screaming out his holiness. It says the elders and all the great people that we read in the Bible, they have these crowns and they're throwing them at his feet and they're falling down before him. And they're going, oh, holy God, who is like you? No one is like you. You know what the difference is between them and you? Their eyes are open to whose presence they're in and ours aren't. And so when we come to a worship service or you're in a circumstance or you go to prayer or you're in the shower reading your Bible, something happens. You stand in the same presence of the mighty God as these beautiful saints and angels. He is literally near us. And we don't even have the audacity to have reverence for him. Or maybe it's not reverence. Maybe that's not the issue. We don't even have the audacity to trust that he is taking care of our needs. 
And I want to kind of wake us up today. Because maybe today you recognize that during worship. Maybe today in worship you're going, man, my God is good. And you bawled your eyes out. My mom was. I saw you. She's going to heaven. I don't know about the rest of us, but she's making it. And maybe, though, this is a message for you later. God is near you. You just need to look for him. How could God be around me? This is the worst circumstances. He told you he'll take you through the valley of the shadow of death. That's where he'll take you. He says, do not fear, though, for I am with you. Psalms chapter 139. If you have your Bibles and your phone, I want you to switch over to that really quick. I'm going to read this whole chapter. It says this. I love this scripture. If you don't know this scripture, this is one that you should write down for later. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. How many of you guys know God knows everything about you? You know that. He knows everything about you. You know my sitting down. In my rising up, you understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. I need to tell you this. God does not see you as a stranger. He knows you intimately. For there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know it all together. In other words, before I even say the words, God, you already know my intentions. You have hedged me behind and before. That means he's put a guard before him and behind him. And you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I can't attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Oh, where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely, the darkness shall follow me. Even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide me from you. But the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, you wrote out my path before I was even existing. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, there would be more in the number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men. For they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O oh Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you haven't read your Bible today, you've just got your first chapter in. How many of you guys are feeling good? That's a good church service. You got a whole Bible reading it. That's great. This scripture is like an anthem to the believer. Lord, you know everything about me. You're not surprised by my yesterday, and you're not going to be surprised by my tomorrow. Before I even speak a word, and I want to talk to people right now who are dealing with sin in their life, and I'm not talking about sin in this moment. I'm talking about sin this last week and the sin that you keep falling into. I need to encourage you about something. God still knows you, and you are not far from him. Can I say that again? You're dealing with sin? 
He still knows your inward parts. In fact, he knew before you knew that you were going to fall. He knows your intentions. Yet, he still is near to you. Seek him. One of the scriptures says, seek him while he could still be found. It says, before I was in the womb, you formed me. And you know what he says after that? He recognized something. This wasn't prideful of him to say. This was actually the most humble thing he could say. He said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I have a feeling there's people in this room who need to hear that. If you know that God is near and that he is good and that he has formed you, you have to say no matter what, it doesn't matter how I feel the world made me feel, it doesn't matter how ugly I think I am, I have been fearfully and wonderfully made by a God who knows all things. He goes on to say this, where can I go? To hide from the Spirit of the Lord. If I'm in the highest of heights, if I'm in heaven, he's there. If I go and make my bed in hell or the depths of the grave, he's there. If I go and take the highest wings of the bird or if I go to the craziest part of the sea, you know, go to the Bermuda Triangle, you know, he's there. You know what he's trying to get attention to all of us to recognize? God is not Somewhere out there, moving with the different people, he's right here waiting for you to open up your eyes to him. I want to close on this because I'm going to push over and over and over. And I can sit here for the next, I'll, I'll do a Paul the Apostle on you guys. And I'll preach through the day on the entire night and I won't stop saying it. He's near, he's near. Because I don't know if you know this, but the majority of us need this thing which is called repetition in our brains. Now, I will tell you this sermon, and you'll leave this sermon today, and I would have took a good 35 minutes of just saying the same thing to you. He's right here, right now. He's present. He's present. And we'll leave this place, and we'll go, he's present. He's present. And then we'll get in our circumstances, and we'll say the same exact prayer. Where are you, God? Where are you? And I need to wake up all the sleepers today. Our God is near Every one of you. And there's different revelations that will happen. The first revelation, when you recognize he's near, you find comfort that your shepherd is near you even in the circumstances that you're in. Maybe it's your own rebellion or maybe things are out of your control and you can recognize, oh, you are near. I just need to grope for you. I just need to look and reach out for you. I just need to seek you in these circumstances. A great comfort, a revelation of comfort could come over you. The next time you're in a, in a crazy circumstance, the next time you're in confusion, the first thing you should do is not say, God, come meet me. The first thing you should say is say, God, where are you in this place? I want to find you. I'm seeking. I'm groping. As in darkness, God, I feel alone, but I know that you are with me. For the scriptures say that there is no place that I could go that you are not near. That's the number one revelation is that you can find comfort if you could grab a hold of this. The second revelation that you could find is that when God is near you, you are protected, which means you have no fear. When you recognize that God is near, you know what happens to your life? You walk in boldness. You know what it means to walk in boldness? It means that you go walk into a place and not fear what other people think about you. That's boldness. Sometimes we think boldness is not being afraid of the monster under your bed. Some of y'all, I know some of y'all got problems with that still, and that's not a joke. That's, I know you guys are laughing, but that's real. People still have fear issues. But I want to talk about this. When you know that God is near, you know the scripture that if God is for us, who could be against us? And you walk into a room, and some of you guys are afraid of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the actual salvation of this world. You carry in your heart. You, carry, you read about it. You study it. You know it. But you forget that God's near. So when you're in public and you, you're in your workplace and you know you have an opportunity to share the gospel, you get afraid of what they're going to say about you. Not recognizing that the fear, I'm sorry, that the, that the fear of man should be put to the side because you're standing before God. First revelation is you find comfort when you recognize this. The second revelation is that you don't have fear. 
But the third one, I, I, I think this is like level three revelation. This is like the deep revelation. Is you get the fear of the Lord. Or what? maybe I should say it this way. You'll find yourself trembling in every place you go. How could you not? When you walk into your closet or into your room and you recognize that the holy God of all creation, the Lord of heaven and earth, the master, the king, God, the one who created all things, the one who knows your ins and outs is dwelling in your room, you tremble. When you go to your workplace or you're in your car and you recognize, oh, my God is near, you tremble. And this is what I mean by tremble. It's like I, I mention these guys all the time, but it's like John. He sees the Lord. The revelation of the Lord's there. What does he do? It says he falls down on his face as if he's dead because he sees, oh, this is how great you are. Your thoughts about me are like the sand on the shore. You're this great, yet you concern yourself this much. Or maybe, maybe you become like Paul. He encounters Jesus, right? And, and he trips out. Everyone around him freaks out. And there's just fear because they saw the Lord. They recognized his presence. Elijah wouldn't be fooled by any other sound. He knew, I will know the Lord's voice because I know his presence. Comfort. You don't fear the things of this world. You will tremble before him. And the third, or the, I'm sorry, the fourth one, this is my last one. This is a big one. This is an entire sermon in itself. When you recognize he's here, this is the fourth revelation you can receive. I'm sure there's a million more, but the fourth one I want to talk about today is you can and will please him. One of the questions I keep asking on Wednesday nights and on Sundays is at the end of the service, instead of asking, was everybody happy with the sermon, I have to ask this question, God, was that good to you? Are you happy with that? Because in Malachi and all these scriptures, we read about these worship services, and God says, I hate your worship. Let that sing in for a second. I think most of us in here, we come to a worship service and we think, well, I'm singing about God, so surely he's happy with that. I'm at church, so surely he's happy with that. But in scriptures, over and over, he tells his children, man, I hate your worship. Oh, your clinging cymbals and your sounds. I hate it. For you come to me and you sing your songs, but your hearts are far from me. You come into these services, right? And you're, you're singing out and you're dancing, but then you go home and you just totally ignore who I am. You go back to the friendliness of the world. He says, I hate it. I hate it. That's what he says. But if you and I could get the revelation, oh, he is here. He is near me. Not just at the church service. Not just when the band's playing. No, no. He's with me in the car. He's with me when I'm watching TV. He's with me when I'm wherever, when I'm with my job. And we can get this recognition. All of a sudden, you have to decide something. God, I'm going to please you. Or God, I want nothing to do with you. And I know in this church right here, most of us are going, I want to please him. Today's sermon was so simple. It's something you can put in your pocket. Something you should repeat to yourself every day. God is not far. He's here. He's here. <laughs> can I just say this? Stop waiting for the move of God in your life. Stop waiting for the perfect worship service. No, no, he's here. And I, I'll be real with you guys. I hate that for the last like eight weeks I've cried every service. I, I don't like crying during service. I want to be, have fun. I want to make you laugh. But there's this, it would be unfair of me if I'm the guy on the microphone today and we have this setup where I talk for 45 minutes where I just told you, hey, you're great, you're good, go home. No, 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 I need to tell you, you're in his presence. I need to remind you, the one who knows your thoughts. Guys, men, the one who knows your thoughts, men, you know why I'm calling out you men? Because we have fooled one another over and over and over, 
pointing out the errors of other men, elevating our own selves, looking at how wrong they were, not ever recognizing who we were, and the mercy and grace he's had upon us men. And I'm saying men because you're the head of your home, the scripture says. It says God's the head of man, and man the head of woman. And I'm looking to the men going, your leadership depends on your recognition of whether or not you see God. For he is not far from you. He is not far from us. Jesus makes it clear. He says, don't you know that two or more if you gather, I myself will be in that room with you. And this is my fear. This this is my fear. That you've been raised in church so long that the wonderment of Jesus has become the per usual Sunday. And you don't even care that he's near anymore. And you're the one who doesn't have a fog around you and you can't see the buffet. You're starving because you lost the taste for him. And you said, I rather would have the food from Egypt than the bread of life. I'd rather be eating of the world. I've been eating the bread of life. I've been eating manna all my life. It's from heaven. It's from the Lord, but I'm just, I'm sick of it. I want quail. If you know what I'm talking about, you've been in the church long enough to know what I'm talking about. And you've lost the taste for his presence because you've been desiring what was back in slavery in Egypt. It's crazy. Because they list it, the dates, the meat. I just don't know if I want your bread anymore, Jesus. And the Lord's going, that bread is me. I'm going to have you stand to your feet for a second. We're going to pray. and I'm going to pray us out of here. We're going to close. We'll sing a song. And I'll be honest, I don't want to cry every service. I, I said that earlier. I was excited coming in because I was thinking, oh, this is one of those sermons where we go, oh, this is great. God's near me. And you'll put it in your pocket and you will. But I feel this urgency, the shake, to wake up the sleeping Christian. I do have this urgency. And it's not just because I feel like the end is near. That, that's not actually it. It's really... Because I see so many of us starving in the midst of his presence. I see so many of us on our knees starving, withering away in our Christian walk. Being consumed by the ideologies of the world. Literally last week I said, if you're agreeing with the world, you should have a red flag in your heart. And I want to wake us up and say, don't you know that you could be fed? There's a buffet of the bread of life right before you. He will feed you and nourish you. He says, I'm a good father. Don't you know that if your children asked you for a bread, you want to give them a rock? He says, I'm even greater than that. I will give you even more than your natural father would. We close our eyes. Father, I pray over every one of these people who put their hands up right here, Jesus. The Father, you would open up their eyes to you. Oh God, you are present in this room right now. God, you've been present at our job, in our homes. You've been present, Father. You, you, the living God. I can't explain who you are anymore. And God, these people are putting their hands up and going, God, I want to see you. I need your comfort. I need to have the fear of man removed from me. I need to tremble. God, I want to make pleasing you my desire. So, Father, I pray over every hand right now, Jesus, in this surrender posture, that, God, you would reveal your presence. That, Father, these would become Jeremiah's and Isaiah's and Elijah's. That these would be called Peter's and John's and Paul's. People who were so great that they carried your word for generation to generation to generation because they recognized you are near. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 
We hope you enjoyed today's sermon. Once again, if you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com, where every dollar advances the kingdom of God. Until next time, be blessed and go do the great things God has called you to do.